Good afternoon. Today, Eric and I are going to take you through some concepts we've been working on together pertaining to rendering, storage, and display of still photographic images with high dynamic range. First, we consider the scene, the human visual system, and the photographic reproduction. To start, let's examine how we perceive the dynamic range of light around us. The human visual system is exposed to a huge range of light levels from the world we see, from starlight to moonlight to direct sun. Our visual system adapts to this range and even in an instant can capture a huge range of light intensity. In photographic systems, our base aim is to capture and reproduce this world as perceived by the photographer. Until recently, photographic reproduction has been limited to SDR, or standard dynamic range, which is less than we can see. Our discussion today is how we hope to enable photography to take full advantage of high dynamic range displays. A lot of color science is based on the situation where a light source is incident on a surface and the light reflected from that surface is captured by a detector. In photography, however, the camera almost always sees a scene lit by multiple light sources, such as direct sun and shade, and often containing emissive objects, such as sky. These can increase the range of the input stimulus by several orders of magnitude compared to a single source and reflections. That is, the scene is high dynamic range. One of the beauties of the visual, human visual system is its ability to adapt to a large range of this input stimuli. And more amazing is our ability to create and accept an SDR reproduction of the HDR world. Artists have done this for centuries. In this example, Sargent compressed the scene range down by many stops. The window incident on the daughters in the foreground and the urn on the right would probably have been about a thousand times brighter than those in the shadow. Yet the painting conveys the scene beautifully in a medium that only holds about a hundred to one range. He was painting what he perceived, something very different than what was imaged onto the retina or exposed into our cameras. When this is done well, these SDR reproductions give clear association to the original HDR scene. Here's another example by Rembrandt. The scene light from the two faces would have been vastly different in the real scene, but in the painting, they're very similar, but they still convey the range of the scene. This ability of an artist to create this kind of reproduction that's entirely believable must mean the human visual system has some sort of internal HDR to SDR compression scheme that allows our reproduction to do all this in the first place. We've been making 2D SDR re representations of the world for roughly 50,000 years since we started writing on cave walls. Through paint, print, photography, there's been some improvement in the output range, but it's primarily been limited to standard range of six to eight stops or, 100 to, or 200 to one. Charcoal on rock, paint on canvas, ink on paper, silver halide emulsion are all limited to the absorption and scattering of incident light. The dynamic range of prints depends on many factors, such as the paper quality, the ink, the dye, pigments, and we see noticeable variations from the cheapest newspaper with very limited range to the most expensive fine art print, which has, been, has much better dynamic range, but still nowhere near what we have with HDR displays. In print, the diffuse white value is encoded just below the brightest part of the range and where the paper reflects most of the incident light scattered. Diffuse white is critical to aspect of HDR photography that I'll discuss in a moment. I came across Impression Sunrise at the Monet Museum in Paris a few years ago. I was over there for the ISNT Color Imaging Conference. Turns out neurophysiologist Marge Livingston, who happened to work in my dad's lab at Harvard for many years, has written extensively about this painting and how color and equiluminance scintillation interacts with the human visual system to make this painting really pretty significant. And I have no idea if this was intentional but when I saw it that day in Paris, the, painting was, the way the painting was lit resulted in a specular reflection of the incident light 
off the brush strokes of the painting, just where the colored sunlight hits the water. This effect effectively increased the dynamic range of the stimulus I observed. The specular reflection off the brush strokes lifted it above the diffuse white. And intentional or not, this is an HDR painting, maybe the only one out there. By the way, CIC is going to be held in Paris again this fall, shameless plug. <laughs> and while I'm there, I plan to go uh, sneak back into the Monet Museum with a spot meter and take some measurements of this. Fast forward to the present day, and HDR display technologies have evolved to enable media with greater and greater dynamic range. But the term HDR can be confusing because it's associated with so many different concepts. From scene through display. So let's take a look at these. The base meaning of HDR scene is that the scene has a large range of light intensity distribution, dis, distributed spatially across the field of view. As with my first image of the boat, this scene has direct sun, shadow details reflected, and here it also has a mist of sun and sky. HDR capture is a device that can obtain an accurate representation of this large range of light intensities in the world. Digital cameras with large pixels, large well depth and low noise, can capture much of the range that a human visual system can distinguish. And cameras with smaller pixels employ computational photography methods of cap capturing a series of brackets at different exposure times and combining them together to extend this recorded range. Apple brought computational photography to the forefront of consumer imaging with iPhone 4. I took this set of brackets with a prototype in the summer of 2010, and a couple crazy, crazy months later, they appeared in the fall Apple keynote with the introduction of HDR photography on iPhone. Garrett remembers that. <laughs> it even made the newspaper in Bury St. Edmunds, English, England, the town where I took this picture. HDR compression, or tone mapping, is the art and science of getting from this captured full range down to a much smaller SDR range while maintaining the perception of the original range. Basically, by computational means, we are trying to do what Sargent and Rembrandt were doing. Both our capture and tone compression has advanced greatly over the years and is enjoyed by billions of customers taking trillions of photographs every year. This and other examples of computational photography has enabled high-quality photography from very small cameras. Displays with higher than standard range have been an important part of the video and motion picture field for several years. Television, smartphones, tablets, and computer displays are rapidly moving to HDR technologies. And HDR displays are now in the realm of still photography. Display capabilities are always improving and reaching unprecedented dynamic ranges with higher peak brightness values and lower blacks. Newer OLED display technology, for example, having improved power performance quality trade-off, allows for regionally controlled brightness without lifting the blacks as you get when making an LED backlight brighter. iPhone has included OLED displays for over five years, and that's a lot of HDR displays out there. Having displays with range greater than print lets us not just make SDR images brighter, but lets us render parts of the scene into the HDR headroom and separate the diffuse white from the specular highlights or emissive objects, kind of like when I saw Monet's painting and the specular highlights popped above the diffuse white. And these high dynamic range displays also have a greater range of shadow detail. In SDR, this photo looks good when the diffuse white is just under the paper white, probably the page of the book. Anything brighter gets rolled off or clipped. In HDR, we use the added headroom to hold the highlight detail and adjust the rest of the range to look natural. Adjusting the range can make the image a little brighter overall, but this depends on many factors and can be much more complex compared to just turning up the brightness. So we have HDR capture, HDR tone compression, and HDR display. But still photography has yet to solve the HDR format problem. How do we reliably and predictably hold the extended range? 
let's back up and talk a little bit about how we hold image data and di digital files. Image data can be divided into two, two families of formats, scene referred and output or display referred. Scene referred holds the captured scene, the physics of the scene, as the cam camera captured the range of the world. Output referred holds what we want to display after the processing or compression that we've done to make the picture beautiful. Raw data formats, seen referred, such as Adobe's DNG, are designed to store the light distribution of scene compensating only for the sensor and the optical characteristics of the camera. Apple ProRAW is a flavor of DNG designed to store scene referred data computed from iPhone multi bracket fusion. But this data is not meant to be viewed, for it needs to be converted to an output referred encoding. Cameras that capture the full HDR range first store the data into one of these formats, scene referred formats. The data is then processed by either the camera's image signal processor or a raw conversion software program to produce the output referred data that is appropriate to be viewed, edited, printed, displayed, or shared. Until recently, this data has been limited and constrained to the SDR range to fit print and SDR display systems, encoding in sRGB or P3, for example. For HDR display systems now available, we need a new output referred specification for larger range HDR still image data. And standards to the rescue, of course. It's expected that ISO technical specification 22028-5 will be released this spring. Dash 5 provides a new reference display specification and color encoding for output referred HDR still photographs. Compared to sRGB, notice the lower black level and higher peak level and the definition of diffuse white. Nicola Bonnier and I are project leaders of the ISO Digital Photography Committee, wrangling this multi-year effort with many discussions of many standards bodies, countries, companies, and experts build, building on the ITU-R video standards. So now we have a reference definition for SDR and HDR output renderings. As with sRGB, dash five specifies the encoding and reference conditions for HDR stills and designated to be deployed in any suitable image file format, such as HEIC, JPEG XL, AFIF, and others. Let's take a look at how we can create these renderings, starting, for example, with scene referred DNG data. Recently, in DNG, we added optional metadata called Profile Gain Table Map to store a recommended grid of local tone correction curves so that downstream processing can convert the scene referred data into display referred using the camera manufacturer's intended method. Particularly useful to have as an optional starting point in an editing workflow that makes the camera's display, matches the camera's display rendering. It's important to stress, in DNG, we didn't specify or standardize any method of going from HDR to SDR with the tone compression. This is a way to specify how we hold the compression curves in the files and how this information should be applied to the raw data. The profile gain table map takes us from a large scene range down to a particular output dynamic range. Manipulating these curves lets us create output that looks great for a given dynamic range. We can use all the compression to go to SDR output or less compression if our destination is, range is larger. Here we have the iPhone Pro Raw image in Adobe Camera Raw where you can optimize the look of the photograph with the Apple Pro Raw profile in uh, the raw converter with this amount slider. You can see it. Where's my cursor? Yeah, this is that. Here you see the slider moving back and forth. So you can create, by having it turned up all the way, you can create an SDR output, or you can create an HDR output where you may want to turn it down. So essentially, we're able to create a dual rendering of this image. This DNG raw conversion workflow is one example of how a user can edit both the HDR and SDR renditions. 
This would be an advanced workflow that gives the user more creative control over the output. Eric will show examples of this using the new beta version of ACR and Photoshop. In another workflow, a photo editing app might let the, the, cre the user create the HDR rendition and then run a tone mapping algorithm to derive the SDR rendition automatically. The other option is the dual rendering can be created in the camera system in the first place, where the camera automatically produces both SDR and HDR optimized rendering, using whatever magic they come up with. To summarize, the two renditions could be automatically generated, manually edited, or a mixture of the two. And these methods could use simple paramedic algorithms or elaborate machine learning models. Digital photography adopted sRGB, P3, and other specifications to hold the SDR output targeted to look great on prints and SDR, or shared. And very soon we'll have 22028-5 that will specify how the image HDR data will be encoded. Now the next question. Can we combine the flexibility we had in the example of the DNG plus the profile gain table map workflow efficiently and, and to increase with a workflow that's efficient and compatible with an output referred format, such as sRGB or 22028-5? Please let, let me know. If, if anyone knows a better name for this dash five, um, please let me know, because it's, it's not going to catch on unless we come up with a better name. So any ideas would be greatly appreciated. To cope with the range of displays used outside the two reference conditions, we need something new that is adaptable. The solution is to add new metadata to an output referred format so that it can later be mapped into a different range. As the new OLED iPhone displays became available with brighter and higher range, at Apple we needed to take advantage of those improved displays. So on iPhone, we added new kinds of internal metadata to make our photography more brilliant and higher range in these new beautiful displays. By adding gain map metadata to our scene referred SDR photographs, we created a simple way to extend the SDR data into the new display's HDR headroom. This metadata preserves the spatial locations of bright areas of the scene by using an underexposed bracket as the basis for the gain map. This gives better control and quality compared to just stretching the SDR data to fit the range. We've been using these gain maps for several years on iPhone, and then in joint discussion with uh, Adobe on DNG and ProRAW, folks at Adobe started playing with these gain maps too. And this led to an alternative and improved way of calculating these gain maps that we're talking about today. Going back to Eric's cute fox, dual rendered in SDR and HDR, instead of using the underexposed bracket as the gain map, we could store a ratio or quotient gain map created by dividing the HDR image by the SDR image. So whenever algorithms, whatever algorithms we use to create the manipulation to make the dynamic range compressions of the original two renderings, these are combined into a new quotient gain table map by this division. As with our iPhone metadata, we can store the SDR base layer and multiply it by the gain map to achieve HDR rendering at display time. And on the flip side, we can alternatively store the HDR rendering as the base layer and later compute the SDR rendering optimized by multiplying the base HDR by the inverse of the gain map. As Eric will now describe and show in detail, this gives us a simple, flexible format we've been looking for. Eric? Hey, everyone. Thanks, Paul. So as Paul was explaining, the central idea here is to have a base rendition of an image and a game map that's stored into the file. The base rendition is the primary image or main image, and the game map is a secondary image along with some metadata. You can also think of the game map as an optional tag that goes into the header of the file along with the base. 
And as Paul mentioned, one of the interesting things about game maps is that they work in both directions. So that means that the base rendition could be either SDR or HDR. And we'll see a little bit later on why you might want to choose the base to be one or the other. So here's how to compute the game map. We start with HDR and SDR renditions of a photo. Divide the two and take the logarithm of the result. Paul mentioned earlier how you might obtain these SDR and HDR renditions. However you do it, they should be in the same color space and have a linear gamma encoding, so gamma 1.0, in other words. We have these K constants, a couple of constants, to avoid numerical issues, since divides of logarithms don't work so well near zero. And the game map is expressed in log base two, so it has an intuitive photographic meaning, right? So if the game map says zero, that means the HDR and SDR values are identical. If the game map is one, it means that the HDR rendition is one f-stop brighter than the SDR rendition, and so on. From, from a conceptual point of view, the game map is this signed floating point image with positive and negative values, where positive means to brighten and negative means to darken. But when it actually comes to storing it in an image file format, well, most file formats use integer pixels. So we need to do a bit of post-processing. And the way we do that is with a normalization. So we first find the minimum and maximum game map values and apply a transform so that the minimum value is mapped to zero and the maximum value is mapped to one. At the same time, we can apply an optional gamma transform. We've sometimes found this helpful to optimize the distribution of the pixel values for integer coding. If you have a very asymmetric game map where all the values are on one side, you don't want them all to be quantized into one bin. So a gamma is an optional parameter to try to redistribute those pixel values before you save them. So once you've done that, you have this normalized version of the game map that's in the zero to one pixel range that you can then scale to any n-bit integer coding range, like eight bits or 10 bits. So computing the game map involves some parameters and constants, which we need to store into the file as metadata. So here's the list. It includes the small offsets that I mentioned earlier to avoid numerical issues, the minimum and maximum game map values, the optional gamma parameter, a Boolean flag to indicate whether the base rendition is SDR or HDR, and then a pair of values which define the HDR capacity range. This is what defines how the game map is going to be interpolated at display time, as I'll explain in a bit. So it's just a handful of scalar values in the metadata. So everything I've said so far is about how do you compute and store a game map. And that's useful information if you're writing any app that creates HDR content, like a camera app. Now let's look at the other side, which is how do you use a game app that's in a file at display time? And this would be useful information for any app that wants to display HDR content, like an uh, image viewer or a web browser. So we read the base rendition in a linear color space and the game map from the file. And if the game map is a different resolution, you resample it to match the base. Now, you'll recall that we stored the game map in this normalized zero to one space, right? So we need to undo that transformation to get it back to its logarithmic version. And that's where the metadata comes in. So using the minimum and maximum values that are from the metadata as well as the gamma, we can apply the inverse transform and get the game map back to its logarithmic representation. The final step is to combine the game map with the base. And this is where things get interesting. So instead of just applying the game map directly, we apply this weighting parameter, W, which I'll come back to in a moment. So we have the weighted game map and convert it to a linear scale factor using the exponential base two, and then multiply it with the base. And then we have those two small constant offsets again 
which are used to avoid numerical issues. So it's applying the inverse transform. So this whole process of applying the game map is intended to be very lightweight and GPU friendly. So just to illustrate that, I've rewritten that entire pipeline from the previous slide as GPU pseudocode. We start by reading the base and game map images, which are probably represented as textures. Apply the inverse normalization, which is a power function and a linear interpolation. And then apply the weighted game map to the base. So that's an exponential function and a couple of multiplies and adds. As you can see, it's just a few lines of shader code. Now, there's one small but very important detail that I've been glossing over so far, and that's this parameter w in the last line. So what is that, and what do we use it for? To explain that properly, I must first talk about HDR capacity. What is that? So HDR capacity, I define it to be the property of the display that expresses the ratio of the peak luminance to the SDR or diffuse white level that Paul mentioned earlier. So as you'll see, the formula looks very similar to the one that I used earlier for computing the game map. So you take the HDR white level divided by the SDR white level and take the log base two of the result. So as an example, if your SDR white level is 200 nits and your HDR white level is 1,000 nits, then that ratio would be five to one. Take the log base two of the result, that's about 2.3. So that means that your display has 2.3 stops of overrange capacity compared to an SDR. So once you have the HDR capacity of the current display that you're trying to show the HDR content on, we can compute this fractional value F between zero and one using the minimum and maximum HDR capacity values that come from the game map metadata. So this basically gives us a measure of where we are within the displayable range that the game map was intended to be used for. Now, if the base rendition is SDR, then we just set the weight parameter W to be equal to F. So that means it's a, a continuous value between zero and one, where zero means don't apply the game map at all, and one means apply the game map completely. And if the base rendition is HDR, then we set W to be equal to F minus one, which lets us apply the game map in the inverse direction. So really, W is just the scalar value between minus one and positive one. Now let's take a break and take a look at game maps in action. Give me a moment, please. See if we can, there we go. So what I've done is I've written a small demo app which can read and display embedded game apps in real time. The first example that I have here is a case where the base rendition is SDR. What you're looking at is the SDR rendition here. This is a standard 8-bit JPEG image in the P3 color space. And this is the visualization of the game map that is embedded in that JPEG. And if I apply that game map to this base image, then I get the HDR or high dynamic range version of the same photo. So this is the SDR version, and this is the HDR version. And now what I've done is I've set the app into a continuous animation loop where it's just fading that parameter w, that weight that I mentioned a moment ago, between zero and one. Now normally we would compute that value w based on the actual HDR capacity of the display, but just for demo purposes, I wanted to give you an idea of what it looks like visually to interpolate a game map. So you should be kind of seeing it fade between brighter and darker. So you can think of this as a flexible or dynamic JPEG in a sense, or uh, you can think of it like an HDR JPEG with portable tone mapping built in. And one of the things that's interesting about it is that if you take this JPEG and you open it in any app that doesn't understand game maps and doesn't understand 
how to draw HDR content. It's just going to show the HDR, uh, sorry, it's just going to show the SDR photo. So it's going to show this rendition, which looks okay. Right? So you can think of this as an HDR JPEG, but with backwards compatibility built in. Let's take a look at one more example. Now, in this example, the situation is reversed. The base rendition is actually HDR. Okay? So this is the base rendition of the file. It's actually a photo in the new JPEG Excel format. So the base image is a 16-bit per component JPEG Excel photo in the REC 2020 color space. And here is the visualization of the game map that's embedded in that JPEG Excel file. And if I apply that game map to this base image with a weight of minus one, so applying it in the inverse direction, then it's going to tone map this content to SDR. Okay? And now I have the app set to a continuous animation loop again where it's fading smoothly between zero and minus one. So you should see like the alpine glow on the mountain kind of like getting brighter and darker. So what I've shown here is kind of a demonstration of game maps working in both directions, right? So in the first example of the waterfalls, the base image is SDR, right? And the game map is applied in the forward direction to derive the HDR rendition. And in the second example, it's the opposite. The base rendition is HDR, and the game map is used to tone map it down to SDR. So let me switch gears now to camera raw in Photoshop, Adobe Camera Raw in Photoshop. And um, last fall, Adobe released high dynamic range output as a technology preview feature in ACR. And when that feature is enabled, as it is now when I um, enable the HDR display, then it allows our image processing pipeline to produce over range of values to the screen, but also to files that are exported to disk. And one of the ways you can visualize that is with a histogram. For example, if I zoom in here, you can see that the histogram is now divided into two sections. There's an SDR section on the left and an HDR section on the right, where this vertical bar here represents the diffuse white or SDR white level. And you can see for this image, most of the image content is within SDR, as it ought to be. But there is a significant portion, mostly the top of the mountains, which is in the HDR section. So I have this HDR rendition of a photo here, and I can use all the normal sliders that you have in camera raw, like white balance, exposure, contrast, texture, masking, and so on, to edit the photo till I like what I see. But one of the things that we're still experimenting with is how do we give the users control over how the image is tone mapped to SDR? Now you might be thinking, well, if I'm doing an HDR rendition of a photo, why do I care how it looks like in SDR? But as we've talked about earlier, screen capabilities vary a lot, right? So even if I'm editing this photo on a very capable HDR display, I might be sharing it with someone who has an SDR display. Or they might have an HDR display that's being viewed in a very bright environment, and so it doesn't have as much HDR capacity. So that's why we have this checkbox here called preview for SDR display down here. And if I turn that on, it gives me a preview of how the image would be tone mapped by camera raw into SDR. And moreover, I have these additional controls down here that I can use to kind of tune exactly how the tone mapping is done, right? Do I want the highlights brighter or darker? Do I want more or less local contrast? And these sliders are intended to cover both global and local tone mapping techniques. Now, for this particular image, probably the most interesting slider is the last one, which is called highlight color. And the reason is, whenever you have an image like this with brightly colored highlights, there's always this question of, you know, how do you map those colors to SDR, right? Do you scale them independently? Do you, do you like, desaturate them? How do you avoid clipping individual colors, right? Like, these are kind of standard gamut mapping questions. And so as I scrub the slider back and forth, you can kind of see that there's a very pronounced difference in the appearance of the colors on the top of the mountains, right? Do I want more or less color? Do I care about them clipping or not? And this is a slider that lets photographers you know, season to taste. So what I've given you 
here is a very brief overview of how a photographer might generate both HDR and SDR renditions of a photo. You know, maybe editing the HDR version for reference, but then optionally fine-tuning the SDR rendition so that they can have more control over these two ends of the spectrum. All right, so let's go back to the slides. Hmm. So authoring apps have a lot of choices when it comes to making game apps, including the choice of resolution, number of color planes, the bit depth, and compression settings. Game apps don't have to be the same resolution as the base image. The main reason to think about using a lower res game map is to save space in the file. So in this example, I'm using a quarter resolution game map, so it's half the width and half the height. I think that's a, generally a good place to start if you're experimenting. Game maps can be monochrome or color. If they're monochrome, it means that the same gain value is used for all the color channels. And if it's a color game map, then each color channel gets its own scale factor. As we saw a moment ago with that example of ACR and the highlight color slider, different tone mapping methods might make different choices in exactly how bright colors get mapped to SDR, right? Sometimes desaturating them or even shifting their hue for a better looking result. So if you want to capture those types of color side effects, you need to use a color game map. Game maps can have a different bit depth than the main image. For example, in a HEIF or AVIF file, the main image could be 10 bits per component, but the game map might be only 8 bits. Game maps probably should be compressed to save space, but they don't have to use the same compression settings as the base image. Here's an example where I'm using JPEG Excel for compression with a one megapixel color game map. I've compressed it with three different quality settings with three different file sizes. The reason why I go into all of these details is just to make it clear that authoring apps have a lot of you know, freedom to explore these encoding options and therefore to explore that trade-off between quality and size. This whole game map concept was intended very much to be agnostic to file formats. I've prototyped game maps in a handful of common ones, including JPEG Excel, JPEG, AVIF, and HEIF files. For JPEG, there's a lot of different ways we could do this, but one way to do it is to st store a standard J uh, compressed JPEG stream using app markers, like the way you would store ICC color profiles. With JXL, we're storing the game map as a compressed JXL bitstream, a raw bitstream, with a unique box code to identify it. And for base media file formats like HEIF and AVIF, there's already a standardized way to do that, which is to use an auxiliary image with a unique identifier. And in, in all of these cases, the game map metadata is stored using XMP because all of these formats have a standardized way to represent X and P. One of the major benefits of game maps is that they provide portable tone mapping, right, for HDR content. But the price of that portability is the extra overhead of storing the game map in the file. I did a preliminary study of 50 landscape photos where I compressed them with JPEG Excel and a color game map at quarter resolution and found that the game map was about 15% of the size relative to the base image. Again, authoring apps have a lot of freedom to explore. Do they want to make the game map smaller or do they want to focus on quality? Now we've talked about how the base image could be either SDR or HDR, but why would you want to choose one or the other? 
And I think the main trade-off to think about here is compatibility versus quality. If your base image is SDR, then that means that any legacy app that doesn't understand game maps or HDR content will just show the SDR rendition. So that means that if your priority is backwards compatibility, it's probably a good idea to choose your base to be SDR. Now, on the quality side, there's a couple things to think about. One of which is that whenever you apply a game map to a base image, the result is always, in some sense, approximate. And related to that, if your base image is SDR, then that means your game app is generally going to make the image brighter, right? It's going to bring up the highlights and increase the contrast. And that means that any compression or quantization artifacts that are in your base image are going to become amplified and therefore might be easier to see. So this means that if your priority is to make the HDR version of the photo look as good as possible, you should probably choose the base to be HDR. And I'm going to turn it back over to Paul. Thanks, Eric. So this workflow achieves something akin to dual mastering done in motion picture, yet to be stored efficiently in a single file. HDR displays are wonderful because they enable us to present photos with that extra level of realism and impact. These methods are particularly important in the mobile world where photos, tablets, and laptops are used in all kinds of viewing conditions and the display brightness is changing constantly. So the kind of the manipulation, that weighting factor that Eric showed is something that we use when we're showing these images. These quotient gain maps are a way of encoding the difference between SDR and HDR renditions and a means of interpolating between them. They offer several advantages such as being able to adapt dynamically to the current display and viewing conditions, providing creative content control by the image author, supporting local adaptation, local tone correction, offering backwards compatibility, and being GPU friendly. We believe these gain map methods are vital as we move to HDR still photography. At the ISO TC42 meeting in Cupertino a couple months ago, Apple and Adobe put forward the gain map metadata concept and have just submitted it for an official Form 4 to uh, commence the project with ISO. Our aim is to come to quick consensus in order to facil facilitate industry adoption. This work will be assigned an official number soon, and we're eager for input from member countries and experts. And anyone interested to contribute, please speak to me or Nicolas Bonnier about joining ISO TC42, or if you're already a member, being able to come and join our ad hoc group to argue about this stuff for the next year or two. The work Eric and I presented today started as a collaboration over several years on DNG and ProRAW with us and Thomas Knoll from Adobe and Garrett Johnson from Apple. We'd also like to acknowledge contributions from those folks listed here who are key contributors to the project. So that's our presentation on how we hope to use these quotient gain maps in metadata in order to bring still photography to new flexible dynamic range output for display. We feel these new methods will significantly change photography and allow for us to take full advantage of new display technology. Thank you.